Hello, I'm Jonathan from Mnemonic, and today we're going to be talking about how to identify applicable EHS regulatory documents that apply to your business, to your organization, to your institution. I'm going to give a bit of background information about this today, and hopefully it will be helpful going forward as you try and figure out which EHS regulatory documents apply to you. A little bit of background about myself. I am the CEO of Mnemonic and also the founder. Started in 2008, so we've been at it for 12 years and very, very happy to be with you today. Thank you for taking the time to watch. I'm an engineer by training. I don't actually have any legal background and everything I've learned about the law and about the way regulations work has been done through my work at Mnemonic and lots of readings. I'm very passionate about world-class compliance systems and programs along with easy to use software. At Mnemonic, we believe that businesses, companies, organizations, public institutions can operate efficiently and avoid spills, worker injuries, product recalls if you have a robust compliance program in place. And we're going to discuss a little bit the regulatory compliance piece of that today. So a small safety moment. This webinar is being done during the crisis of COVID uh, 2020. And so perhaps if you watch this webinar in the future, you'll be able to think back to COVID. But our safety moment today is about COVID-19, uh, where at Mnemonic, we recommend working from home if possible. Our team is all working from home. Wash your hands as if you just cut jalapeno peppers. And perhaps even more importantly, encourage others to do the same. Family members, friends, make sure that they are also taking precautions because this is a society level battle. Um, there's some great resources online. We've linked to a couple here and you can click through those in the presentation. But there's of course many other resources uh, to set up checklists and policies and procedures around pandemics and around COVID-19. Um, a little bit of background information, Mnemonic uh, does webinars every two to three months, and we've done a whole bunch on regulatory challenges, issues, uh, and those can all be found on our website. They're all freely available, mnemonic.com slash webinars. Um, and some of the material we'll be covering today was, was done in more detail in some of these other webinars, so feel free to go online. You should be able to find the video the slides and other background information. So during the live webinar, we did a, a couple of quick polls, uh, but we're gonna skip over those today. And uh, this poll, I think the vast majority of people who participated in the live webinar uh, had were coming to their first one and, and maybe 30 or 40% had been to a previous mnemonic webinar. So our agenda today, uh, we're gonna briefly talk about why regulatory compliance matters. We'll then dive into the four types of regulations. And that was a webinar we did last year that was very popular. Uh, it goes into a lot more detail. So if you're interested in that specific agenda item, I encourage you to go look at the, the webinar that's entirely devoted to that. Uh, we're gonna talk about the various sources of regulatory obligations. We'll discuss consolidated versus non-consolidated legislation and regulations. We'll talk a little bit about well, when industry standards become obligatory. Uh, we will discuss the importance of looking at agencies and paragovernmental institutions versus pure legislation. And then we're going to do a little bit of a product demo of Mnemonic. This is not a sales pitch, but we just want to show you how we help businesses identify their applicable EHS regulations. Great. Um, so why does this matter? The, the summary I give to folks who perhaps aren't very involved in regulatory compliance is that the purpose of regulations and standards is to incite behavior that would not otherwise occur. And if we look at the history of environmental legislation coming out of the United Kingdom back in the 1800s, it was around shared resources like air and water, um, and, and then similar uh, shared concerns around safety brought about safety regulations. So humans are fallible, <laughs> and it's very important that we set rules and guidelines to ensure that we behave in a certain way that keeps our environment safe and our workers safe. And this sounds perhaps obvious, um, but a lot of people sometimes criticize red tape. I would argue that most regulation is well-intentioned and, and does bring benefits. And then of course there is some that maybe gets out of control. 
this example, I used at uh, a team meeting at Mnemonic recently, coming back to COVID. Again, this is in uh, March of 2020. It is possible that COVID was transmitted or COVID-19, coronavirus, I should say, was transmitted from a bat to a pangolin. This is a pangolin. It's an endangered species. Uh, then to humans. And pangolins are an endangered species. You're not allowed to trade them or sell them. Uh, but nevertheless, of course, in some parts of the world, such as China, there is a trade of pangolins. And it's possible that this non-compliance with endangered species regulations led to the worst pandemic since the Spanish flu. Now, this is not a proven theory. It's something that scientists are still looking into. Nobody really knows where exactly how coronavirus uh, mutated and became a human disease. But uh, it's possible that this entire global catastrophe is related to a non-compliance by, uh, by some people in China. So compliance matters a lot. <laughs> That's the summary here. Um, all right, four types of regulations. Now, I'm going to just cover this very briefly. But like I said, there's a webinar that you can uh, access on our website that goes into a lot more detail. So why do types of regulations matter? Well, not only do you want to identify the regulations, but you want to understand uh, the nature of the regulation, the intent of the regulator. If you can think like the regulator, you're going to have a much better chance of staying in compliance. And so to understand that, I think you need to understand the four types of regulations. And some people talk about performance-based regulations as a new trend, but I would argue that this terminology is more accurate where you have ends and means, micro and macro. Then you have four types of regulations. So you have micro ends, micro means, macro means, macro ends. Now, if this sounds a little bit confusing, don't worry. We're going to go into more detail. So what is an end versus a mean in the context of a regulation? So regulations command the avoidance of some ends, uh, meaning uh, you could think of like air emissions coming out of your stack versus means where regulation commands the use of a means. It could be issuing a certain PPE to your staff. And then micro versus macro. Micro, as you might guess, is you know very targeted, very specific, and macro is at a much larger level. So macro, we could think about environmental regulations related to fuel efficiency for the entire car industry. Um, or you could, uh, for micro, again, you could think about PPE, or you could think about having to use specific fire suppressants uh, for certain types of activities. So yeah, means focuses on actions, things that you can do, install a particular valve, retain certain documents, versus ends, which focuses on avoidance. So being able to evacuate everybody from your building in a certain amount of time, or keep your emissions below a certain level. And then you can combine these, so you can have actions plus avoidance. And the example here is the use of protective equipment, PPE, so a means that has passed approved testing standards for fire or impact resistance. And that's an end, so it's a test, it's, a, it's an objective. And then micro versus macro. So micro focuses on the components of a problem, macro focuses on the problem as a whole. So traffic, traffic safety regulations, red lights, stop signs, those are very micro. And then macro, like I mentioned earlier, fuel economy regulations, uh, electric vehicle quotas, things like that. So a very brief comparison here. I think we have two more slides on this topic and then we'll move along. But micro means, so prescriptive, these are kind of the regulations often we think of as being regulations like you must do this, or if you have a boiler, you must do this, this, and this. So very prescriptive, very specific versus micro ends, which can also be very specific. It'll, it'll be those air emissions regulations, um, and it's often performance-based. The famous example being uh, ozone emissions, um, or uh, sorry, uh, SO, SOx emissions back in the 1980s related to acid rain. Uh, macro means, so that's more management systems. When the government starts saying you have to have a management system in place, a safety management system, a risk-based management system, those would be macro means. Uh, and then macro ends would be, uh, you know, car fuel efficiency regulations, uh, general duty provisions, et cetera. And we have some more examples here. I won't go through all of them. I want to keep this webinar nice and short for you. But micro means, yeah, install hazard warning signs, micro ends, electrical components have to have certain shock resistance tests. Uh, macro ends, you know, keep the workplace free from recognized hazards. That's fairly 
vague, fairly large. It, it's potentially difficult to evaluate, but it's something you need to do. Macro means would be yeah, engage in threat and risk analysis. Um, so that's macro, but it's very means driven. It's telling you what to do. Um, enforcement challenges. So as the regulatory body is moving in the direction of more macro means, um, it's becoming harder for some enforcement agencies to audit and inspect because inspecting a safety management system to determine if it's good or if it's effective is very much more challenging than say determining do you have the right valve on a certain pipe. Um, so this is, a, this is a challenge and it's something that's evolving and the regulators are, are also evolving over time. But this should be considered when you see regulations that are macro means. Okay, great. So now that we've covered the first two points of the agenda, the next is various sources of obligations. Um, so legal obligations, things you legally have to do or else in theory you're out of compliance, uh, can come from multiple locations. I've just listed three here, but the main ones will be government legislation that comes through the legislature um, depending on the country and the governments that you are subject to, uh, government legislation will be coming through the legislatures. Uh, then, again, depending on the jurisdiction, you might have some agencies or departments or ministries that are set up and that have the ability to make rules and regulations. And so you definitely want to map out which agencies are uh, in the jurisdictions you operate in. And then standards bodies. So there's standards bodies at the international level, there's standards bodies at the national level, and there's certainly standards bodies at a more regional level. So some of these standards, most of these standards will be voluntary, but of course, some of them will be obligatory because they're referenced in law. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. And some of them are obligatory because your customers demand that your products be certified to um, these standards. Um, an example of this challenge of figuring out who regulates you uh, would be, this is an example in Canada where you have the National Energy Board, which is an agency that regulates inter interprovincial or international uh, pipelines and other types of energy activities. The Canada Standards Association, which is a national standards body, and then the provincial regulator. Um, and so there's a general trend in here to move towards management system regulations where they're saying you have to have a safety management system. But in addition, you have those prescriptive regulations that are coming from the provincial government. You have standards that are coming out of the Canadian Standards Association. And so you need to understand who regulates you and how they regulate so that you can uh, try and stay in compliance as much as possible. So those are the various sources of regulations at a high level. It's your legislatures, it's then your agencies, and then standards bodies. Uh, consolidated versus non-consolidated legislation. To what is consolidated legislation? Uh, the definition that we found is consolidated legislation includes amendments made to it since it was originally passed by parliament, Congress, or another government body. Um, and it's important to know that whether or not in the jurisdictions do, do the legislatures that you are subject to, do they uh, consolidate the legislation or not? Or do they partially consolidate it? Because different governments act in different ways. In Canada, all the acts and regulations are fully consolidated, which is fantastic. Every time there's a change within a few weeks, that change is usually incorporated into, the, into a consolidated document. However, in the United Kingdom, acts are consolidated periodically, but not regulations. Um, so you gotta be careful because you might look at a regulation and an act and the act's consolidated and you think the regulation will be also, but it, it's not. Um, Denmark and China, just to take two examples, have very little to no consolidation of their regulations. So this makes it very challenging because you have to read the original document plus all the amendments. And very often over time, you will have amendments that contradict each other or that override each other. And then, and that becomes quite challenging. And then India and Egypt, I just picked those two. Not only are they now consolidated, um, they are really difficult to access the documents, really difficult to figure out where the documents are, which ones are the most accurate, the most up to date. So. For certain jurisdictions, I definitely highly recommend purchasing a, a service from a company that, that offers an organized database. Mnemonic offers that, but there are other companies in these other regions. Um, great. So that's consolidated versus non-consolidated legislation at a very high level, of course. 
Uh, just make sure you think about that when you're operating in a jurisdiction. You want to know how does the legislature work and where do I find the documents? Are they consolidated? So I mentioned earlier that industry standards can become obligatory. And this happens when agencies or governments incorporate references to industry standards in their documents. And this happens a lot because the government says, well, we don't have the expertise to determine what is the best practice for boilers or for forklifts. And so we're going to rely on a standard that someone put out, uh, an organization put out, and we're going to reference that in the legislation. So when you're trying to comply, you've got to map out, you know, not just the regulators, not just the agencies, but also the standards bodies. I've listed a few here you might be familiar with. Uh, National Fire Protection Association, which is American, but it's referenced in regulations around the world. Uh, ANSI, which is also American, but also referenced around the world. Canada Standards Association, the European Committee for Standardization, there's many, many more. Um, and I have a few examples here just to show you how governments tend to do this and some of the challenges involved. So this is an example from the Washington uh, Code, uh, Washington State Code, a uh, chapter on health and safety core rules. And so here it says an employer who demonstrates compliance with exit route provisions uh, will be in compliance with the corresponding requirements. So to, to, to know, you know, am I in compliance with the NFPA 101 2009, you have to go get that document, read it and determine it. Um, and, and that can be a challenge. NFPA is great. They offer some of their uh, standards for free, but other agencies you have to pay for it because they're copyrighted. Another example here, this is from Canada in the province of Newfoundland, uh, where they reference not just one standard, but two. Um, so except as otherwise provided in these regulations, the standards uh, governing the design, fabrication, installation, testing, and storage must meet CSA standard, you know, Z7396 and NFPA. So you gotta read both these standards and you gotta kind of hope that they don't contradict each other and that you can uh, meet both of them. So that's a challenge where you, you don't have to just comply with one standard for a specific issue, you have to comply with two. And there could be some contradictions or some challenges involved in complying with both. And then my last example about standards is also from Canada and New Brunswick, where the legislation, as you might guess, moves relatively slowly. Uh, governments evolve fairly slowly. And so what often happens is the government regulations reference an older standard. They don't reference the most up-to-date version of a standard. And here, for example, they're referencing CSA B13909 um, and the updated version in 2010. This standard has already been updated twice in 2015 and in 2019. So you gotta be careful not to go grab the 2019 version and comply with that because in fact, the government's requiring you to comply with the previous version. And this can be quite, quite challenging. So you wanna take that into consideration and uh, bake that into your compliance assessment programs um, because very often the regulations do reference older versions of the standards. Great, uh, so that's when industry standards become obligatory and some of the challenges involved. It's a, it's a longer story, but uh, the short answer is that it's challenging. Uh, the last agenda item before we do a little bit of a demonstration is the importance of agencies versus pure legislation. So what's important here to remember is that different, there are very different approaches in terms of regulation and in terms of enforcement in different jurisdictions, with some governments relying more on agencies and others uh, relying more on the legislatures and, and core government institutions. So in the US, the EPA and OSHA and other uh, agencies issue a tremendous amount of rules um, and regulations, which you definitely need to pay attention to. And those usually do eventually get, um, they do eventually get included into the federal code of regulations, but there can be a delay, there can be some uh, coming to force over time. So you gotta be, keep a close eye on these agencies. And in Canada, the NEB, the National Energy Board, and the Alberta Air Emissions um, Energy Regulator uh, publish documents in different locations, in different formats, notably PDF, and other jurisdictions vary a lot. So you gotta figure out where did these agencies publish, what's the format they publish in, and where, how do I get their documents? And just one example here is, this is a 250 page document that was jointly published by Alberta Parks and Environment, which is the equivalent of like the EPA for Alberta, and the Alberta Energy Regulator. 
So they got together and they said, we're going to write this document, Master Schedule of Standards and Conditions. Um, it's 200 pages. It's in PDF. It's a table. I mean, it's really painful to, uh, to try and automate or process. And I picked out just one random uh, example where here it's saying between December 15th and April 30th, uh, you cannot conduct certain types of activities south of Highway 1. And I won't read the whole thing, but basically, not only do you have an obligation here, but you have an obligation here that is time limited and that's geographically limited. And it's being enforced and regulated by two different agencies uh, in the same jurisdiction. So this can be really challenging. Um, and we had a customer where their crews were out doing construction uh, south of Highway 1 and an inspector from one of these agencies was driving by, saw this, went in to the site and gave them a non-compliance. So finding all of the applicable documents from all the agencies and then going through them meticulously is a critical part of compliance. Um, and Mnemonic can help you with that, but you can also do it on your own, but it is challenging. So you definitely want to look at your agencies and the documents they publish. Uh, and then the last thing I think I wanted to mention on, on uh, agencies and, and other sources of obligations are guidance documents. So the EPA defines guidance documents as an agency statement of general applicability and future effect. It's not a regulatory action, but it sets forth a policy on statutory, regulatory, and technical issues or an interpretation of regulatory issues. And ultimately, uh, this provides critical information on how regulations apply interpreted and interpreted by the agency. So guidance documents, they're not obligatory. You don't have to read them. You don't have to comply with them. But if you skip them, if you gloss over them and you just look at the regulation, there is definitely a risk that you uh, won't be in compliance or you won't comply in the way that the agency wants. So you definitely want to look at guidance documents, uh, read them, and use the context provided to uh, to determine what actions you need to take as an organization. All right, fantastic. So we've done, you know, why regulations matter and it's to incite behavior that would not otherwise happen. The four types of regulations, which is the macro and micro and the means and ends, and take a look at our webinar on our website if that interests you. The various sources of obligations coming from legislatures, agency standards bodies, Consolidated versus non-consolidated legislation. So make sure you know if your jurisdiction consolidates this legislation or not. Uh, industry standards become obligatory when they're referenced in laws, regulations, rules, and you want to make sure you know which standards are being referenced, which version, um, and get your hands on those standards. And then when you're in a jurisdiction, you want to make sure you understand the relevance of agencies, their ability to issue guidance documents, their ability to, you know, where they publish their information. Uh, and, and compared to pure legislation, where usually there's one source, you know, the legislature, agencies can be a lot harder to track. So that's the main core content I wanted to share today. And the next is I'm going to show you a small demonstration of mnemonic and how mnemonic identifies regulatory requirements for its customers. So let me close this presentation and I'm going to go to our website here. And I've chosen just the Alberta General Industry EHS Comprehensive Compliance Checklist. It's a bit of a mouthful, but what Mnemonic has done is we have built questionnaires that are based on commonly regulated issues. So there's 900 questions in this EHS questionnaire. And for each question, we have mapped it to the applicable regulations. And here is a list of regulations in Alberta that we have processed. And I will scroll down and just show you some of the questions. So we have questions around environmental management, uh, permitting, plans, energy conservation, etc. And to, to do this assessment, I'm just going to click on Start Audit. And I will select a facility in Alberta. And this is really just an example. We have this for over 200 jurisdictions around the world and we're going to do air emissions let me find air emissions here we go so air emissions open burning specific air pollution so i'm just going to select these three categories i'm going to see that there's 24 questions here there's two items there 23 there um, we have lots of categories but i'm going to scroll all the way to the bottom 
hit save. And now what it does, is it generates a checklist, a questionnaire for those air emissions categories that I just selected. And once this loads, we'll see that, you know, the first question is a qualification question. Are there air pollutants of emissions from industrial premises in the facility? So we can say, uh, uh, yes, uh, there are. Conforming is not exactly the right word, but, but it works. And then, so here, does the facility hold a valid license or permit for these air pollutants? I can click here on details, uh, and I'll see this one, actually, there's maybe no specific legal requirement. But let's find another example um, where there are some specific legal requirements. So here, you'll see that the question of, like, do you have a monitoring plan in place? Well, there are a variety of different regulations in the province of Alberta that require you to have a monitoring uh, plan. Um, and we'll notice here that this uh, third section 9.11 is being updated by mnemonic. So what we've done here is identified the regulations and the sections that apply specifically to air monitoring plans. And as you answer this questionnaire, mnemonic can then generate a list of regulations, a list of sections that you need to comply with based on your operations. And so this has been a lot of work, as you might imagine. And these questions are based not just on what's regulated in a specific jurisdiction, but what's commonly regulated across jurisdictions and also some best practices. And as you answer these questions, you can then determine uh, which questions, uh, which, sorry, which regulations apply to you. Um, but this, this questionnaire is really about general industry. And I just want to show you an example of a regulation that is outside of scope because, for example, if I go to Texas, I'm going to go to a Texas legal register that I've built. And I have a number of documents that are in this legal register. So the legal register is the output of that questionnaire. Once you've determined what type of activities you have, we can then generate a list of regulations that apply to you and a list of sections. Uh, and this specific regulation here, 40 CFR 63 subpart quadruple F, uh, I'm gonna, I opened it up in another tab, so I'm just gonna click on it. And this regulation we've processed at Mnemonic, but it's really just for the chemical industry. And you can see that we've cut it up to each individual section. And for our chemical questionnaire, we would link these applicable sections to chemical questions. But what I can also do is I can filter this and say, I just want to see the obligations within this document. So if you go to the trouble of identifying the agencies and the regulations that apply to you in the jurisdictions you operate in, you can then use mnemonics tool to more rapidly filter through these obligations. And I filtered this down uh, to just the obligations and I can see you know, when do I have to comply with this subpart. Um, I could click on each one and determine that you must comply with the subpart you know, according to paragraphs one and A1 and A2. So I can click if you start up a new affected source before da, 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 2003. So I could say not applicable. Um, we have not uh, we have not started up, <laughs> I don't think that's a real word, but um, before anything before 2003. And this functionality on mnemonic allows you to leave notes and comments and keep a record of how you're in compliance or how you're not in compliance in general report. But this hard work of processing all of this data and figuring out what are the obligations within each, within each regulation, that's something that mnemonic does and that we offer to our customers. But of course, you could do it yourself just by reading the documents. Um, and that is how you can process an individual document after you've already gone through our questionnaire. Um, let me show you very briefly the documents database in Mnemonic, where you can also use some tools. So you have the questionnaire, and, and that can be very powerful. But if you want to have a cast a broader, a wider net, and make sure you capture all the regulatory requirements, you can use our library of regulations, standards, and other information. So this page here, you can filter all of the 225,000 documents by jurisdiction. So I can filter for uh, European Union, for example. I could filter by industry sector, by document type, and by topic. Um, and these topics are the same topics that you saw in the questionnaire just a few moments ago. So Mnemonic has taken the time to process all of this information, uh, keep it in an organized way just to help you move faster. But if you follow the guidance that we gave in the PowerPoint presentation 
you should be able to do a lot of this work yourself without paying anybody, including the mono. So let me wrap up and first and foremost, thank you for, um, let me bring this, make this a full screen. So first and foremost, thank you so much for watching this video. I hope it was helpful. Uh, if you would like more information about mnemonics, please do contact us. Our job is to help improve the world by helping businesses stay in compliance with regulations, standards, and other best practices. Uh, we have offices in Montreal and Shanghai, and we have partners in Europe and the United States that we work closely with. And we offer this global regulatory database that I just showed you, regulatory monitoring when alerts happen, the audit questionnaires, and there's a software that's based on the web and on mobile devices. We have a seven-step approach to comprehensive compliance. If you'd like to learn more about that, please contact us or take a look at our webinars on the website. And for watching this video, if you watch it early enough, uh, we are offering 25% off during this COVID crisis uh, for the assessment of your regulatory compliance. So if you would like help to determine what are the regulatory documents and requirements that you have to comply with for EHS, uh, we are offering a time-limited discount on this. Uh, to help businesses who are struggling through COVID. Thank you so much for watching the video. Thank you to those who participated in the live webinar last week. If you have any questions, please email us at info at mnemonic.com or give us a call. We would be thrilled and happy to help you. Thanks so much. Have a great day and stay safe wherever you are.